Hi, this is Mark Graben from Kinexus, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled How to Navigate the Transformation Continuum. Our presenter, who I'll introduce in a minute, is Roger Chen from Indiana University Health. So with that, let me introduce a, a good friend of mine and of Kinexus, Roger Chen. Roger has more than, uh, he might not like me adding it up and doing the math, but he has over 30 years uh, of experience in various improvement and leadership roles. Uh, he spent um, a, a, a long time at General Electric where he uh, reached the level of a Six Sigma Master Black Belt. And then also, I think, um, as, as GE uh, embraced Lean, Roger became a senior Lean Value Stream Manager. So I first met Roger going back, uh, gosh, roughly 10 years ago. We were introduced by a mutual friend when Roger was uh, making a career transition into healthcare. So he has led uh, performance improvement and transformation roles at Martin Memorial Health System, at Lee Health, and has recently joined Indiana University Health. Um, Roger has been a great contributor uh, to our Kinexus community. It's always been great to run into Roger at different healthcare conferences, and I'm really excited that he has the time uh, to share with us today. Uh, so with that, Roger, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to share the work we're doing here at IU Health um, with the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Community. I actually have the uh, benefit of a live studio audience as the transformation team that's been working on this is here. Uh, we're, we're proud to, to share our current thinking on navigating the transformation continuum. And so this is literally fresh off the press. We, we, we're planning to uh, introduce our overall approach to Transformation 2.0 at IU Health to our extended team. So if there are any team members on the phone, um, we'll, we'll be going into more detail on this tomorrow. And so what we're looking at as the System Transformation Office at IU Health is three programs that are really the the, the, the engine for transformation. And um, the one is to be a quality resource center for anyone doing quality and process improvement work to be an, an available resource to walk you through <clears throat> technical questions, process improvement questions, or to connect folks to the right resource in, in quality or in uh, business analytics. Uh, the second, which we'll expand on today is on system initiative deployment, uh, what a lot of folks call strategy deployment or the uh, Hoshin Kanri uh, process of, of connecting strategic plans to operations. And then third, staying true to our lean roots is to have a training institute where we make sure the internal process improvement team are trained to the same technical and change management standard as, as well as partnering with our Leadership Academy on uh, training programs. So the purpose of the transformation office at IU Health, it, we believe the process improvement helps to accelerate the achievement of system priorities through the ap application of lean principles and methods. Uh, lean management is a verb as the process to deploy a strategy to operations. And so what I'll unpackage today um, are, are several layers and staying true to the, to the uh, description of the webinar is, is to look at how rapid improvement work and project management intersect in aligning our process improvement work with the strategic plan and really to frame up what is transformation. I think Mark, when you and I spoke I said, I've had this title for, for many years now, Performance Excellence or Transformation, and, and, and I'm constantly trying to understand what it really means to each organization, and I realize it's really a continuum. So a little bit of on, um, unpackaging is, is to ground us as we think about uh, strategy, that every strategic plan is typically divided into priority areas. A lot of organizations use a pillar approach. And so from a project management perspective, let's consider that a, the, the system portfolio. Underneath that, we'll have a, 
strategic initiatives and in the project management nomenclature, I'd like to associate that with system programs and to really think about that as how the organization wants to allocate capital and people. And then the tactics can be multiple levels. So for this uh, purpose, let's consider those major projects or system value streams. So with that framing, <clears throat> That pause is my advance button not working. Uh, here we go. If, if we look at how uh, one organization um, set this up to, to use Kinexus, uh, I, I look at the strategic portfolio areas as a dashboard. And then within the dashboard where you can develop program panels, now you have your uh, strategic focus areas and then which within each of those, your programs or initiatives, and then under each program or initiative would be projects. And as we know in the world of project management, many sub projects. So we'll spend a lot of time uh, today walking through the taxonomy of project management at an enterprise level and then how process improvement and rapid improvement workshops intersect. Does that sound good? So to frame it up, the first thing is to understand what uh, I'd like to refer to as the nature of the work. So in terms of thinking of transformation as a continuum, a lot of organizations begin their lean journey by learning how to do value stream maps and rapid improvement events. And I, I think continuous improvement professionals have all seen the, the classic slide that it's important to standardize and then improve and standardize and then improve. Yet for some reason, we tend to launch right into improvement and um, come up with a term without understanding the necessary preconditions for improvement to occur and to actually sustain and standardize across an entire organization and spread. So um, I'm following the Zen philosophy of going backwards down the path and, and say maybe we should shift our locus and understand what the environment is for standardizing process and spreading process and actually come up with processes for standardizing and for spreading. While also realizing there will be very important improvement work that needs to happen. And the improvement work part is really addressed by the elements of uh, lean as daily management and, and the classic process improvement work. And I, I believe, and as, as with many of my colleagues, that all of this work is the foundation work and the precursor before an organization can truly become successful at innovating. And, and this is really the, the, the uh, tilling the soil and, 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 and where the innovation ultimately comes from once we build our improvement muscle. So unpackage. Unpackaging the program now of system initiative deployment. Uh, what that means to us is how to align strategic system projects and then how to also spread best practices when we uncover them. Uh, this is where we'll engage users, uh, interdisciplinary teams with applicable lean content. I think this phrase is very relevant because at this point it requires business acumen and skill and experience to, to know how to flex uh, based on the nature of the program that's being deployed as well as the environment of the organization. And, and then as, as this work uh, matures, how information is shared either through live report outs or things that can be done with technology today as we're doing to have a webinar or to develop videos for knowledge capture and sharing are all very important. When we think about the knowledge repository and socializing of learning. 
So on this slide, you'll see the classic plan, do, check, act, but we're introducing two key phases before we get into plan at this level. And that is, you consider it, you know, three Ps, do, check, act. Um, so the first is the plan scope. The second is the plan scale. And then I think the third is the classic plan, which is where we're doing an, uh, the design of the countermeasures that we wish to implement. So I'm going to spend the next slide now on packaging the concepts of scope and scale. Uh, but my first qualifier is um, I, I, I'm not attempting to follow any convention with project management, book of knowledge, or, or folks that have project management certifications. I greatly respect the work. I think it's very valuable. Um, uh, perhaps this is the, the, the fluidity or the mix um, in, in the learnings from the field approach in terms of how to have an, uh, an approach to this work. So the limitation on the slide I'm showing is that it's a static slide for a model that's intended to be dynamic. So if uh, we talk through the element of scope here, what scope is intended to mean in this case is really the project resource mix that the organization is willing to commit for the problem it's trying to solve or the goal it's trying to achieve. And so this is where we would bring in tools like the stakeholder analysis, the Gantt chart with very clearly defined milestone reviews and who the reviewers are and also what other support functions are required, IT, HR, legal, and, and, and an assessment of the cultural acceptance of the type of change being considered. Um, we believe all this is very important to prepare for the eventual change management or training and communication processes once the project management part of the work concludes. So the project resource mix is informed by the expectation of how the project will ultimately scale at the end of the work. Um, a key thought here is connecting it back to value stream mapping and rapid improvement work. Uh, but my belief is a rapid improvement workshop is simply a very complex project on a highly compressed timeline. Because the timeline is compressed, it's risky, in fact, dangerous to skip the elements of good project management. It actually places a premium on them to understand them and, and ensure they're being done proactively because a rapid improvement event eliminates the ability to recover from project slip, which is one of the fundamentals taught in all project management classes. Further, in a complex environment like healthcare, which has so many dependencies and longer cycles for test of change, given clinical requirements, license requirements, uh, the, the the, the lower flexibility of having people work outside their scope of license, uh, there, there is a risk that some of the rapid improvement work really needs to be considered in terms of a number of sprints that are scheduled with cycles and reporting periods rather than the highly intense um, one-week workshops that, that many have been introduced to. So that's the description of the vertical arrow that talks about scaling. Um, scaling in this sense is intended to mean the impact of the project, the outcome that is to be achieved and the number of people that will be impacted by the change. And in, in any organization, we look at the benefits as an improvement in quality, a reduction in the cost to produce the service, or an improvement in the customer's experience or staff experience. So 
getting a little bit more tactical now, one of the um, classical quality uh, approaches is to look at work in, in, in something called a work breakdown structure. Um, I like to think of this as enterprise level value streams or processes at the very highest level, level one. And at that point, things would be a, a, an organizational program. Uh, below that, at level two to three, will be the multiple supporting processes or the primary processes, whether they be support function or clinical or whatever your business is. And then inside those processes, as we frame up the work, will be identified projects for short-term to mid-term uh, goals, as well as the associated key performance indicators that are uh, tied to the program or the projects. So um, in keeping with the spirit of this presentation, I'm going to purposefully bound this conversation because there, there's a lot of other work on KPIs and data and project management. So I, I wanted to introduce the structure of transformation at an enterprise level, strategic planning, and then the alignment of the enterprise resources to shepherd this work under strategic initiatives. Um, I, I know I can't hear it, but this is where I would like to say, it. does that sound clear to everyone? I'll, I'll give you a yes in response. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Is that clear to you, Mark? Okay. So yeah. point, I, I'd like to pause a little bit with, with that question and set this up and then uh, take some questions. So what, so I'm talking about process improvement or project management. And, and my question is, so what does this have to do with transformation anyway? Uh, what, what I'm about to lead into is that intersection of process improvement professionals and project management professionals and why there's a heavy overlap in the capabilities um, but they're not the same. And, and to introduce a model of, of how to differentiate what an organization's needs are. Um, I, I think they're, they're very highly related and projects are indeed put in place in order to improve some process. And project management teams that are classically trained may or may not have the benefit of process improvement tools and data. And on the same token, folks that hire into process improvement jobs, and as we call them, uh, lean, lean facilitators or Six Sigma black belts uh, may or may not be grounded in the classic project management tools and, and scoping, scaling and change management and then wonder why uh, we run into resistance in an organization. So both are necessary, but neither is sufficient in, in classic Toyota parlance. But both are required to create the organizational energy in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'd love to see if there are any questions at this point, Mark, before we continue on. Yeah, let, let's do a couple. Um, there's a question here uh, from Ruben. Uh, in your scoping of projects, is there a financial element as part of the selection criteria? Uh, if so, how does that, how does that work, uh, or how do you work with the financial community and the organization? Yeah, well, thanks, Ruben. Uh, Yes, and, and, and it's certainly in healthcare in particular, you know, leading with finance is is um, always a risk. But I think when you look at the, um, I'm going to interpret it two ways. One is to understand the impact on quality, um, cost reduction, and, and hard or soft dollars. On the input side with the resources is, is where I think it's a little trickier. Because, but by doing proper resource planning to understand the labor component as well as any potential capital which is IT or construction then you know what we're really looking at is the feasibility analysis which should be defined and locked down by the by the scale phase that second p in the project if you will um let's see there's one, one other one other question um, in, in one of the first slides you mentioned IU health system priorities. Um, can you elaborate on what some of those priorities are this year? Um, sure. Uh, our priorities are improving uh, healthy outcomes, 
um, uh, improvement and innovation and how that improves our margins, our, our first year turnover. And then we have a, a, a lot of construction activity going on. So we want to be good stewards and how we support that work. Great. We, we actually have something called a promise dashboard, which is new. So we're uh -huh. shifting from the classic strategic plan with the pillars to take it a bit higher level. And that should be available on our website if anyone wants to look at it. Shall we move on? Yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and, and move back into uh, presentation mode. Um, and I encourage people again, feel free to submit questions uh, anytime, and we'll do that again at the end of the session. Sounds great. So, going through uh, what I refer to as the enterprise program management taxonomy, I'm coming up with some visuals now to unpackage this a little bit. So at the very highest level, the organization's strategic plan defines the portfolio with the realization that simply looking at the initiatives will not truly represent all the work that's out there. But it's the place to start. Underneath that strategic plan and the strategic areas is the peeling back as the executive team then says, here are the priorities for the year and to begin to learn. And I think each organization has to do this on its own, what the concept of a program is. And, and this is where I think um, the synonym of what it means to whoever is using it is important and where the concept of scope, scale, and timeline become very relevant. And then the understanding of the amount of capital and the amount of people, resources that are required and the concept of scaling. And it's not unusual for programs to go for multiple years, especially when we start to get into things that are actually impacting uh, populations or outcomes like uh, mortality or readmissions. And, and so it's within that context, and I think this is the context setting slide, that we then begin to differentiate what we mean when we talk about a project. And the classic definition of a project, there's a start date, there's an end date, there's a defined outcome, and there's an owner. And um, I remember when I first started learning project management, there was some statistic that over 90% of projects either missed its deadline or went over budget or missed its deliverables. And I think if we were to um, estimate that number now, it's probably more than 95% of projects miss their deadline, under deliver, or um, go, go outside their scope in some way. So within the portfolio, I wanted to hone in on what some classical functional programs would be. And this really could apply to any organization. Since uh, we're in healthcare, we call it clinical operations. But this is also an area where some of the conflict comes in. Uh, IT as a function runs on project management and, and they're pretty good at it. Construction by definition is project management and they're very good at it with very uh, specialized tools and techniques for project management. As I like to say, you got to know when the concrete's getting poured because it's going to set whether you like it or not. And then in operations, we also have many projects, but that domain does not lend itself to the inherent training and project management that other functions have. Uh, so with that, areas will have their annual objectives, which are typically programs that they have to manage. And then within, so within the programs, we'll have groupings of projects. So to give some examples of that, in, in IT and healthcare over the last decade and still to this day, uh, electronic medical records would be a massive program, which would then spin off projects in multiple areas. In construction, um, we've been here. <coughs> oh, excuse me, my team was afraid of coughing and I, I guess the power of suggestion made me do it. Uh, the uh, hospital of the future or any type of 
um, hospital without walls or um, all, all the ambulatory centers going on are all major programs. And then in, in, in the actual clinical operations, uh, a pretty good example, especially over the last few years with um, <clears throat> the CMS uh, uh, five-star rating, uh, hospital-acquired conditions became uh, a program that every hospital in the country was uh, running in, in, in some way, shape, or form. And so within those programs is then where we would begin to peel apart the various levels of projects. And, and hopefully that's where some of the previous concepts then are helpful because as we know, not all projects are created equal. The important thing here though, is to shift the, uh, the, the perspective a little and talk about the process of, of managing projects. So once, Project families are defined. This now comes back into the lean world. They, they may lend themselves as value stream maps. And so value stream maps will typically have some type of a sponsor and a steering team, then the actual team that comes in and does the value stream work and rapid improvement event opportunities are identified. And then we run off and conquer. And we hit our goals and the star rating improves and we live happily ever after. Sometimes. So um, I thought about this and I asked myself, what's my point here? And in using plan, do, check, adjust methodology, it has to be a verb that we're managing, planning, doing, checking, and adjusting. Not just going through the form and the checklist. So, uh, as I told one of my team members earlier, this is my captain obvious day. Forgive me for stating the obvious. However, um, given my experience and seeing this poorly executed, I, I, I continue to think about how can we better communicate this in a way that is um, understandable and accessible to people. So here's an attempt with a, a lot of work by um, my former team at Lee Health to put together a plan, do, check approach to program system program management. Um, so the first thing is to realize that every program or project has phases. So it's up to the team to agree on the time for each phase and very importantly, what the milestone review points are and the goal, no go decision points. Um, there has to be thought about who the communication and training plan for all tiers of the organization, the, the projects intended to impact. Um, there has to be clear and understood metrics. Uh, data governance is nice. However, ultimately, we do the best we can with what we have and just be the clear what the metrics are for the particular project or program. Uh, we also have to realize that a part of uh, project management is to know when to pull the end on, that any project must have a, if, if we aren't making this progress or the realization that the risk factors changed or the support factors changed, that the project can be deselected so that resources can be redeployed. Um, and so, uh, my, my thought here was plan for conf conflict resolution, but, but have it stated up front. Uh, understanding the progress to the ultimate deliverables and, and how that's being realized in each phase. And then a couple things, which I'll go in on the next slide. Uh, who, who has the decision rights on the project first? Who's, who's giving an input and who's actively managing it? So that's what this would look like on the next page. And, and, and there would be boxes like this for every phase of the project or program, as well as whatever tools the organization's accustomed to using. So one example of this in, 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 the, in, in, in the scope phase, you know, the, the extended planning phase is uh, what's the issue to be worked on? To, to have a, a very good, solid narrative of what the issue is and why it's important to the organization. It, it would then go into the, the roles of who 
will make decisions, who is giving input, and who will actively manage and do the work. And in this example, um, we, we use the Plan Do Check Act form, A3 forms, to tell the story, capture decisions, and tell the narrative. So uh, my last presentation slide, um, I wanted to go through some strategy deployment taxonomy, project management taxonomy and definitions. And I wanted to also crosswalk this for the OI and Kinexus. So Kinexus started as a continuous improvement database and the power of an idea. And uh, I think what we've realized along the way is an idea could be the equivalent of a task simply a task that somebody has to do by a certain date. An OI could turn into a project with a, a short-term time frame, 30 to 90 days, with uh, 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 resources that are discretionary to a manager to, or to an area. Or it could tie into a program that the organization is interested in running with more complex capital and people demands. Or it could actually become eventually a strategic initiative. So when I thought of how complicated this is, and there is a slide on the following page that shows a lot of detail uh, from one organization of how to define these um, different levels of work, um, I thought of the image of the Ouroboros, which is the snake that eats itself. So there's an infinite amount of connectivity between these concepts and, and just the power of an idea to become something amazing. So with that, Mark, I will turn it over to you for announcements, and then we'll take Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Roger. And we've got uh, some questions, and they will continue coming in. So go ahead and make a few announcements for uh, people who are joining us today. If you could advance it, please. So we have... A number of upcoming Kinexus webinars. If this happens to be your first time joining us, welcome. We hope you'll sign up for our webinars in the future. We do these presentation style webinars uh, basically monthly. We also, for Kinexus customers, have uh, a separate webinar series, which is also um, happening monthly. Kinexus training team office hours, or it's kind of informally known as the Banna and Rippy show, where Matt Banna and Ryan Rippy from Kinexus um, teach you about different ways of using Kinexus and cool new features. And they do that for about 30 minutes every month. You can sign up for that at kinexus.com slash webinars. Then the next presentation webinar that is open to all uh, it, we don't have the exact date set yet, but in May, um, one of our Kinexus customers, Chad Westbrook, uh, he works for a company called Agco. They make uh, Agco Corporation. They make uh, agricultural equipment. He's a manufacturing engineering manager and uh, an Agco production system manager. He's going to be giving a presentation uh, titled How to Use a Structured Approach for problem solving. So Roger's presentation today was, I think, very much sort of at, you know, the, the higher level framing of Lean and, and Chad's uh, presentation. We'll take a deeper dive into different problem solving models and methodologies that build on PDCA or PDSA uh, in a different way. So we don't have the registration link there uh, at kinexus.com slash webinars yet, but there is a link where you can uh, sign up for email notifications and we'll um, let you know about Chad's webinar. Uh, the the, uh, the June and July webinars uh, are also getting um, squared away. So we've got a lot of great content coming up um, in the next few months and the rest of the year. Um, so if you could advance that again, please. Um, if this is, well, so we, um, we also have a podcast series. The audio from today's webinar will be uh, put out there in the podcast feed as we always do. That was initially an idea from a customer actually who said they wanted to um, you know, re revisit the audio while they were driving or on a plane. Um, you can sign up for that or you can listen at kinexus.com slash podcast. You can also find us uh, in iTunes, Google Play and Stitcher among other places and apps. Uh, if you can advance it, please. 
We have some other resources on our website. If this is your first time watching a webinar, we have got dozens of past webinars. Uh, I should go through and count them, but it's at least dozens, uh, maybe 50 webinars on demand. You can view the recordings, check out the slides. Um, there's a lot of great content there from Kinex's customers, uh, from authors and thought leaders and, and, and different consultants. There's a lot of great content there. And we also have a blog. We have, I should say, we have two blogs. Um, you can go to blog.kinexus.com. And then we also have a separate customer blog. So with that, and we've got email addresses and links and, and info here. Um, let's see, uh, there's a question from Ryan. Uh, there, there have been recent articles discussing the importance of the CFO or senior financial leadership support of a lean systems approach. But the one question concerning financials, do you see the CFO or any key senior leadership being vital to this transformation continuum approach? Um, I, I, I do. I think all senior leaders are vital and it's important to provide a framing that makes sense to all stakeholders in the organization. And, and so we, we put a lot of thought into this concept of whenever we're doing work, and I really appreciate this question because I, I thought I, I really didn't reconnect this well at the end, that the nature of the work depends on the process and whether it's a process that needs to be implemented, therefore standardized, or if there's work being done with a lot of variation. So it's really standardization workshops. It's people that have uh, a lot of depth in developing standard work, observing work, uh, doing the more technical things like standard work combination charts, and then working with the uh, frontline teams to come up with material that can be trained to, to drive standardization across an organization, which, which is very different than if um, the goal is to spread something which then requires change management work and understanding if the organization has an adopted change management process and, and what the various cultural enablers are in order for change to be effective. And so I appreciate the question on the CFO. And you know I think it's important for all of us to take the position, uh, you know, I've actually had this conversation with several team members. It, it's less about us trying to get, understand, you know, why people don't understand our work and more about us understanding what that function is responsible for in the organization and how that work can relate to them. So I think it's incumbent on us to be very good translators and to adapt the language uh, to, to the context of the person that we're working with. I hope that was helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we have uh, another, let's see, here's a question from Douglas. Um, how do you link uh, this model that you presented here to larger excellence frameworks, including uh, Joint Commission, DNV, Baldridge, ISO, et cetera? Have thoughts on that? Uh, Doug and I actually don't know each other, but so appreciate you asking that question. Uh, so in, in any health system, you'll be tied to either Joint Commission uh, or DNV. And, and certainly with ISO, that's the quality standard that all these other frameworks are coming from. Uh, they, they'll, they'll all share a couple things. One, uh, documentation management system standards. Another is effectiveness of training and training plans. And so I think the concepts are very universal and lend themselves to either to compliance framework, documentation framework, training frameworks, and 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 the, also the foundational process improvement work and documentation. Right, Our process improvement work, as we learn in Six Sigma, is founded on define, measure, analyze, improve, control. In Lean, it's plan, do, study, adjust. Both require data to validate decisions and outcomes, and to ultimately, um, as my friend Dr. Joe Gage would say, the evidence will be in the data. Um, 
There's a question from Sue. How do you prioritize projects when you have competing resource needs? Um, I think it would depend on the nature of the projects in relation to the strategic initiatives. And then th there's no easy answer for this one. It, it, it's going to take creativity to see what alternative resources are available in the organization. Maybe, maybe that's where the innovation part of the continuum comes in. And, and so it, it, it's, it, it, it's a great question. It's a classic question. I, I would say in the scoping phase of this model is where those conversations are necessary and why it's so important to have a model to at least put an inventory of all the work in flight in front of us and then to see what the work coming in is going to require. And, and, I, and, and I think you know, Sue, that is absolutely an example of the bullet that says uh, prepare for conflict or conflict resolution, rather. And at some point, uh, somebody uh, in an executive role may need to make a decision, and, and that's what we get paid to do. Yeah. So uh, let's see, another question from Ruben. Are lean accounting principles being used within the IU Health Organization? Uh, not at this time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many hospitals, um, are using lean accounting. Um, I mean, I think it's still, uh, kind of, a, I don't know how widespread the adoption is in, uh, in manufacturing. Um, but a question that might be easier to answer, um, also from Ruben is, uh, your organization open to benchmarking visits from a non-competitor? Yes, we're also in the Catalysis Network, and IU Health um, participates in conferences um, of all types and has a very proud her heritage of uh, doing a lot of great work. All right, here's another um, it's a difficult question. I don't know how I would answer this, but I don't know. We'll ask anyway. How, do you have thoughts on how you would merge a continuous improvement program into digital transformation? I don't know. Is, that, is, that, is digital transformation being talked about uh, at IU Health or other organizations you've been at, Roger? Um, I'm not sure what digital transformation means. If mm -hmm. it means putting as many things whether it's um, business analytics and how you begin to merge reporting and you know put things in the cloud, or if you're looking at telemedicine, I, I think now that question is a fantastic question of what does innovation mean for that organization? Yeah. That's why you see a tentacle there. Um, you know, and anyone that knows me knows that I'm really um, arcing towards innovation. So uh, I uh, would love for to have more dialogue on that. My, my contact info is on there if the yeah. person interested asking the questions interested. Okay. Um, can you elaborate or, or talk a little bit or maybe got some stories um, of things that stood out to you when you made the transition from uh, GE into healthcare? Um, yeah, the first one is I just thought everybody used Excel. <laughs> <laughs> and then it quickly realized that it's really, um, I'm going to use the word here very honestly. It's really unfair to compare industry to healthcare. It, it, it's not a compare and contrast thing. Healthcare is healthcare. And it, the, the, the thing that struck me was the humility to understand the heroic amount of work being done by uh, clinicians, ancillary staff in the most complicated organizational system in the world. 
and 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 how much uh, some some of the people that were in management positions did not have the benefit of a, a lot of the training that folks in other industries uh -huh. go through or the tools you know so I, I had to learn to adapt very very quickly if you know people had word on their computer not excel so we can be immediately uh, converted the PDCA form from Excel to Word because it's not that people didn't want to use it. They literally couldn't open it. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. had many great friends in healthcare now, you know, help me to understand um, healthcare people like lists. So the more things look like a list, the better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you raise a good point because, um, I think yeah, it's unfair to blame people for not knowing things they haven't been taught, right? Um, and I think that comes up a number of ways in healthcare. If somebody in pharmacy hasn't really, if they weren't taught modern inventory management practices in pharmacy school, and mm -hmm. that just kind of leads to a continuation of the way we've always run the pharmacy, or you know, uh, there, you know you, there could be a long list of practices that. Um, could be taken for granted in other settings. And yeah, you know, I think as long as, so as long as, as, as people in healthcare um, realize there's opportunity for improvement and they're open to learning new things, then, then we can make really good progress together. Yeah, the, the learning goes both ways. That's for sure. Yeah. We don't so have. Like we answered every question yeah, out there. We, <laughs> we don't have any other uh, any other questions from the audience. Um, can we can we put your local team on the spot? Do they have questions um, that they would want to just ask you there in the room? And if it's not picked up, maybe you could repeat the question, or we we could end early. But or or we could have people ask them questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have any questions or thoughts you want to share? No, we're, we're having lean bliss in the room, Mark. <laughs> okay. Well, now we have another question come in um, from Jenny. You've mentioned that this is transformation 2.0. Can you elaborate on that nomenclature and what it means for IU Health? Yeah. Yes, IU Health started this lean journey about five years ago, and it's a very large system, so it had uh, some excellent consulting support to get going and built a very impressive internal team, and then wanted to now take the journey truly internal and adapt it to what we're calling the IU Health way. And, and then I had the privilege of being in a, a search process and joining in the organization two months ago. Yeah, so it's different coming into an organization where, um, have you been involved in um, kind of starting the lean transformation efforts at previous stops in healthcare? Um, I've, I've done both uh, Greenfield and Turnaround, and this is, you know, I, I think, um, as Dr. Tassan would say, you, you, you've seen one lean transformation, you've seen one lean transformation, yeah. Yeah. right? But um, it's, it's, so what, what I will say is I, I'm really excited about the talent and the just the caliber of the organization here. And the, the goal is to improve the health of the people of Indiana and to contribute to healthcare across the country. And it's just uh, the, the opportunity to have uh, the, the alignment and the passion and the, um, the, the, the care that, that goes on here is impressive. It, it, there's a lot of things here. So yeah. it, it's really not a comparison for me. Yeah. Okay, oh, oh well, gosh, all right, we got a burst of questions here. Uh, Sue asks, what's been the biggest challenge in using this approach within the organization? So I personally am pretty new. Uh, any of the team members here are welcome to jump in. I, I think uh, 
the intense focus on rapid improvement work has been voiced as um, too narrow a focus, and then it, it started to feel too rigid. And um, you know, it, it's it's a little unfortunate because as process improvement professionals, lean thinkers, uh, we're you know we're we're really being trained for critical thinking. Sometimes we put blinders on. And so I think that's the challenge is to now expand the uh, the scope of the approach and, and to be more adaptable. I, I call it flying at a different altitude. And, and I think Sue's question was also, she added a note here. I think she was also interested in input from some of your team that's there, some of the biggest, cha what's the biggest challenge? Was that Sue's question about the biggest challenge? Does anyone else, uh, anyone there with you? She says, yes. <laughs> Does anyone else there have uh, thoughts that they're willing to share? No? Oh. This is one of the team members. Uh, I'm Jesse. Uh, I think, uh, along with what uh, Roger said, one of the biggest challenges is exactly what he kind of mentioned, and that is, is uh, the adapting to the actual site or healthcare that you may be joining. In other words, understanding to speak the language, understanding to meet them where they are and understand their process and then adapt to it uh, would be the biggest challenge, at least since I've been doing the work. As a healthcare professional, getting immersed into this, um, the understanding that healthcare isn't full of standards and that you can't have standard work for everything because every patient is unique. I'm a physical therapist. I never had a patient that was a textbook patient. So mm -hmm. trying to constantly have, they use their minds to determine what needs to be done, but then using the lean to develop the processes around them or changing the language to understand. So it's more about developing processes to fit the work into instead of trying to make everything standardized all of the time. Okay. We've got a couple other uh, questions that have come in here. Um, Anne asks, what should the split of responsibilities be for a process improvement person between coaching lean principles and doing project management? I wonder if that's our end. No. <laughs> I, I, so I think um, for me, project management is a foundational competency for process improvement professional. With great respect and regard, that project management also expands based on the organization or the function. And so uh, we, we may have gone a, a little quickly over the slide I, I, um, with the, uh, and I'm wondering if, if we skipped it somehow with the um, process improvement or project management, because you can have a niche in process improvement and a niche in project management for very specialized uh, situations and tools. But I, I, I don't believe a process improvement person should be asked to lead projects full time. At the same time, I recognize that there may be gaps. And so there's a value add in coaching or teaching project management to people or being a, a facilitator as folks develop that skill. Uh, there's a question here um, from Michelle. How does the program project strategic initiative approach that you've described interact or intersect with efforts to drive lean daily management or uh, MDI, managing for daily improvement? Different organizations use different terms, but mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? If we go back to the very beginning of the presentation, that's a, a separate program. And so I think the management um, is the recipient of the standardization and the spread that is indeed based on the organization's <laughs> now in place. But you know, it, it brings up another great point. If daily management 
hasn't been established um, will run into that uh, sustainability challenge. Okay, this might be last question uh, from Huey. How do you communicate uh, or train, or maybe you know, maybe it's more about convincing, or you know, how do you communicate about this approach of process stability and spread when executives want to jump right to improvement? Um, I, I think the humble inquiry approach, if you know, folks are familiar with that, to get some context of what the organization's history is at that strategic level to understand if it's a, um, you know, that, as, as I've said um, to, to some of my team members, that, that that's a really loaded question, but those are also the ones that I enjoy the most. <laughs> so, you know, what, what is the composition of that senior executive team? What is their history and tenure? What is the organization's uh, climate and culture with programs and projects um, that have been successful or that have failed? Uh, what is our ability to um, walk it back in terms of showing, you know, uh, how this approach connects to or would have helped? And then more importantly, it will help with the allocation of capital and resources and uh, uh, fitting the right talent to the right work. And I, I want to make one more comment. I, I think okay. it also depends conversation is being held. If, if that senior team has a, a mission control room, if they've embraced visual management, then the story pretty much tells itself. If they haven't, then there may be even more work to be done. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending and, and most everyone stayed on uh, for the Q&A session. So I think there was uh, a lot of Good value and thoughts that that you and your colleagues added, Roger. Um, so I, I want to, um, yeah, th thank you for um, sharing your thoughts and, and frameworks here. Um, Roger's email address is there if anyone wants to follow up um, with uh, with further questions. Uh, if you have uh, questions about Kinexus, you can check out our website. We'd love to have you uh, connect and interact with us on uh, social media. You can also reach out to me. Uh, via email mark at kinexus.com. Um, so again, our next webinar will be uh, coming up in May. And uh, if, if this is your first time, I hope you will make it a monthly habit of joining us um, here for the Kinexus webinar. Roger, thank you again uh, so much for being here with us today. My pleasure, Mark. Great talking to you and to the community. Uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. You too.